We'll jump in here, the title, Engineering for Resilience, the Role of the Structural Engineer. We're going to talk about this concept of resilience that you've probably heard about, and we're going to, I'm going to try to focus on where we think our profession as structural engineers fits into what is any, a growing movement about uh, resilience. Quick uh, kind of disclaimer, you'll see even in the first line there, I talk about earthquake resilience. Really, we're talking about something broader than that, than just earthquake, but uh, I want to be clear that my, I wouldn't call it a bias, but my expertise is mostly about buildings as, about, as opposed to infrastructure and mostly about earthquake as opposed to other hazards. But you'll see, and I hope maybe in Q&A if you want, we can talk about how these ideas apply to beyond buildings and beyond, um, beyond just earthquake hazards. I should also say at this point that while I'm going to show some examples from a lot of different projects I've been involved with and a number of organizations, of course I'm only speaking on behalf of myself, so anything that uh, I say that seems like it might be controversial, that's on me completely. So here's the outline of what we're going to talk about. The first bit we'll talk about this concept of resilience, what it means, what it should mean, how we should understand it when we talk with our clients and our colleagues about it. Uh, the second part will be those two middle bullets about what it means to engineering programs like uh, and new design and for, and for retrofit. And then the, in the last part, we'll talk about this emerging concept of functional recovery, which I think you'll see is a way for us to tie what we do as engineers to the larger resilience idea. So if you've heard about resilience, uh, it may be in the last decade or so as it relates to engineering, but in fact the idea is much older and has a long academic history and you look through the literature, you'll see that even before it got applied to ideas about design and engineering and architecture and planning, it actually emerged from completely different fields in economics and ecology and even psychology. So as a result, there are a lot of different categories and different versions and, and uh, concepts built into this one word resilience. We're not going to talk about any of those because as it relates to engineering, we're beginning to see at least a couple of key ideas emerge and we'll talk about that. Meanwhile, you will see even within the design space, uh, architecture, engineering, planning, a number of models for what it means to be resilient. Here's one from the Rockefeller Foundation, which had a great program for a couple years called the 100 Resilient Cities Program. And they identified that if you're talking about the resilience of a city, there's a number of different categories and then subcategories. And before you know it, you've got 140 something variables that might or might not contribute to the resilience of the city. If you didn't like that, don't worry, because it got updated the next year, and now there's 156 variables. But it's not just Rockefeller. Every organization that you know now is now talking about resilience. Here's another model from an organization called CARI, uh, which is more of a hierarchical, kind of a, uh, a Maslow's uh, idea that some things are more important than others. You see them in the middle. I actually think this one has some benefits because it begins to think about a sequence over time, but it actually, I think, is not as good as the Rockefeller model in some ways. It doesn't matter. The point is, everybody's got a model, everybody's got a diagram or, or, or some kind of a flow chart. Here's one from the United Nations going back uh, almost, almost 10 years now, um, kind of essential steps. But it's not really helpful to us. It's not really meaningful. It's useful to describe what they want to do. But if you look, for example, at the top of the, the slide, essential step number five, make your education uh, and healthcare infrastructure resilient. It doesn't really <laughs> tell you what to do. Uh, it just says, okay, we can think of all the possibilities here and we'll just put them into 10 steps. Not really practical to us uh, as engineers. Now we begin to see our colleagues like at MCR, um think about what this means to engineering and to engineered systems and they have a little acronym that adds up to peoples and they've got a very detailed an academic flowchart because they're academics and if you plug in the data and you go through the flowchart out at the top you can pop out a resilient community. Of course we don't have any of the data to put into those blanks but you can see the way they're thinking about this. It's a very complicated academic model. It also does not clearly tell us exactly what to do. So there's even more than these. Some I haven't even shown you yet, but the point is not that these are good or bad, but that everyone has one, and almost none of them relate to what we think about as engineers. So we really need to try to put in context, well, the lesson it tells us is that there are a lot of people besides engineers thinking about what this resilience means, and if we want to participate in this in a helpful and meaningful way, we need to be able to tie it back 
to what we do as engineers. It turns out that as engineers, we kind of already have our own model for how we think about losses in categories. And this is, I'm going to show you on this slide, my model of how I relate what we do as engineers to resilience. But I'll start with these four terms. You may have heard the, the terms deaths, dollars, downtime as a way of measuring losses uh, in categories, particularly uh, earthquake losses. If you flip those over, you can get deaths. The inverse of deaths is safety. The inverse of dollars is economy. The inverse of downtime is the milestones along the recovery path, two of which are reoccupancy and recovery. So we can now do better than we've ever done before, predict these as attributes of buildings. We do that with models that allow us to predict the damage. So everything flows from being able to predict as engineers what the damage will be in the physical component, the building, the piece of infrastructure, the asset, whatever. 